All right, so what does it take to become an engineer? Uh, so I'm gonna go through, you know, what's your routes that you take in order to become an engineer. And the main route that everybody takes is going through college. So a little bit about my journey myself, I didn't take that direct path where I went straight from high school to college and then go get a career. I, I did a lot of roundabout way until I got fed up with things and I went and got my degree. And so everybody's path's a little bit different and uh, how it ends up and comes out is going to be slightly different between each individual. So your first expectations when you're going to college for engineering is calculus. Calculus is going to be the subject of math that you have to take and is going to be applied throughout your whole entire college journey. After going through and taking college and taking calculus, it's not a big deal that everybody makes it out to be. So it's a little bit harder than algebra, some algebra. Some people actually pick it up and uh, understand it better than algebra. And there's certain parts of algebra that's actually, I think, harder than calculus. But it comes down to your practice and practice and practice. And so you'll go through and you'll do calculus. And then at the end of your whole entire calculus uh, coursework, at the end, you're going to have a doctor in mathematics that tells you, all right, I taught you everything I know about mathematics. Here it is. That's, that's the level of mathematics you're going to have to do when you go through any engineering coursework. I mean, hell, even uh, nurses, nurses go through one, one course of calculus, and there is a reason why behind that. Once you get out into the work field, you don't apply it as much, if at all. And when you do, you know, you, you got to dust off the old uh, books and read up and, and make sure you do it right. That's part of engineering, knowing how to do things. You're going to be given a task you don't know how to do, and you got to figure it out. So that knowledge base on that mathematics is important. Calculus is typically a freshman class. All you guys that are on top of it and already have your calculus done before you even get out of high school, hey, you're freaking ahead of the game. Let's get on you. You know, don't, but don't let it be a thing that holds you back. If you need to go through community college and take calculus, that's what I did. It's going to be fine. And uh, you're, you're going to expand. And so calculus is like your first year. You're going to have additional math beyond calculus. That's going to get into your differential equations. You're going to get into probability and statistics. It was kind of funny when I went through my master's degree for business, and they were talking about uh, all these prob or uh, all the equations that you needed to take or in order to understand all the uh, mathematics associated with it. It's all lookup tables. They use nothing but lookup tables. It's like, how do you calculate this? You put it in Excel. So most of them didn't even know how to come up with those equations. But then I go through and walk through the whole entire proof and everybody's dumbfounded. And so you learn a lot of math. Now you'll eventually get to things that fast for a transformation, especially in the EE world, when you transform from the time domain to the frequency domain, well, that's some fun stuff. But don't be discouraged that you have to take calculus. Embrace it. Treat it like you're learning any new math. Treat it like you're just learning algebra again. You'll get it. It might take some practice depending on, on your level. And do the practice exercises. The next course that you're going to take is calculus-based physics. If you're anything, if your course work was anything like mine, they crammed calculus, physics all in at once, and you were learning things from calculus two in your physics one class. They're not supposed to do that, but that's just how it how it works out. So that's one thing of having your calculus course done before you even 
uh, get to college is, is actually a thumbs up and a heads up because it's just a refresher. But I remember a lot of the things overlapping like that to where I learned something in a different class, but when I went into calculus, when we got to that, I already learned it like two semesters earlier. It's crazy how that works. And so the thing is, is everything engineering, there's a physics background behind that. And you got to understand that phys physics background. I will use semiconductors for uh, an example. So you, you, have, you have silicon, you have boron. I forget the other one. And so whenever you inject boron into silicon, you get holes. And then, uh, so you have holes and then you have extra electrons. That allows the current to flow. You know, that's, that's the basis of semiconductors. You'll have stuff in uh, mechanical too, like structures. Once you understand like steel, you take steel and then you mix it with another composite material, you, you, under, you get a, a, a better material that has both of those priorities. You know, it's, that physics course is important to understand the rest of your coursework. Then you get to chemical, or excuse me, chemistry. It was actually one of my favorite classes. You know, it wasn't that bad and it wasn't that hard. So you understand, you gotta learn all those equations on how a chemical reaction works. And so how that chemical transformation happens when you, when you get energy out and you have these molecules, and then it forms two separate molecules. I'll, I'll take uh, burning, burning carbon. So whenever you burn a tree, you have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. So out of that equation, what you end up with is CO2 and H2O as a byproduct, and then you have uh, energy that comes out of that. So understanding that transformation, matter isn't destroyed, it, just takes on a different property is helpful. I liked it. You get to draw bubbles in the class on uh, the actual makeup of the uh, the compound. You know, if I would go back and had to redo it, I might become a chemical engineer. All right, then you have your general education that you have to worry about. So you got to be proficient in writing in English. Most engineers aren't. It's kind of their weak point. I can tell you right now. Well, that and Microsoft Word hates engineers because half the words we have in there aren't uh, in their library dictionary. So it thinks we're making stuff up and then vice versa. We think Microsoft Word's making stuff up as well. You got to have your, your English or writing. You got to have a foreign language, at least here in the United States, you do. You know, go through that. I did it during my senior year, which was a pain in the butt. So you're going to have some humanities, you're going to have some elective classes. Those are, you're going to have a whole list of choosing from, you know, it's not a big deal. If you have a heavy workload on one end, you might want to throw a humanities or an elective class in there on the other end, just to even out your workload. I looked at those as freebies, freebies is something that I'm going to, that's not going to be as hard as an engineering course. So I would like use that to balance out your workload as you go throughout, you know, be active in your course selection. Don't let your advisor choose all your classes. But if you go that route, you got to know when, when, what is offered when, and then you're going to have some group class where you learn how to work with other people. A lot of engineers have to go through remedial on those courses. You know, now you go through all that and now you're finally at your engineering coursework. It technically starts on your freshman year. So you have calculus, you have chemistry, you all have uh, calculus, chemistry, you have physics, you'll have a engineering coursework. So I was electrical. Our first course was circuits. So that's laying the foundation for your uh, profession or your field of study. So that's what that first year is, is just, just laying that foundational work for you to keep going along. Now, after that, you go into 
So like in CERC, so in EE, our second year was learning everything about electronics, you know, learning all everything about the semiconductor industry, how those work, how, how the MOSFET works, how a by BJT works, how a diode works. Actually, no, diode's the first year, but you, you get the point. It's an advancement on that original circuits or, yeah, circuits course. And you move up. And then after that, you you poke holes at little specialties here and there. Like we'll have a we had a class on transmission lines. There was just one class, so that way you you understand the real world implications of uh, running running uh, electricity through wires. Because you you learn in circuits, it's like oh this is how it works. But then you go into the real world, it's it's not ideal like you just simulate or run you learn that throughout uh, but it's it's just a little coursework as you go along you know same thing with microcontrollers same thing with uh with rf i mean you you get trained as an rf when you're going through ee or you at least have a basic coursework understanding uh coding as well so you, you go through all that. Yeah, coding is your first year, too. All right, now we get to talk about the professors. So there's two types of professors you're going to get. You have the fully academic types, which usually is a doctorate degree, and, and they do teaching full time. And then you have professionals, uh, usually have a master's degree or above. Sometimes you can get by and actually have a professor that has a bachelor's degree if he's worked in his degree or his field for a long time and is a specialist in that particular one. When I went through, most of my professors were actually working professionals. So they, they did their working profession full-time and then part-time it was just uh, teaching a course here and there. That was my experience going through. You might have a different experience, depends on your area, but in general, academia cannot keep up with the pay that industry does. So if, if you go full academic as an engineer, you actually have to take a pay cut. That's the reality of the situation. That's why all the professors were full-time workers, part-time professors. Now, now you get into the whole, what I like to call academic hazing. I know that's not the actual correct term, but you're going to have a coursework. It's probably your first year where they're going to throw everything at you. You're going to get stuff that are nowhere near a particular actual real world example. And you'll have to do all the mathematical equations for that, like, uh, let's say you, you have practice, practice problems. And then when you actually get to the exam for that, it is by far 10 times worse than all of the practice problems that you had. And so like circuits, first circuits, one, two, three. Uh, so, uh, the average score, I think the first year for those circuit classes was 20%. <laughs> Just to give you an idea. So they're, they're trying to push you out. They want to push everybody out that don't want to be there. And so you'll, you'll have a workload as you go along. And like the first year, first circuits you do, when you go to the number two, everybody that was in your previous class dropped out. So they either switched majors or they went on to another course to get that circuits 101 again because they failed and it, it's just like that like the second circuits half pass and then go forth and then some people just decided to say screw it go with another teacher you know you have to deal with that kind of thing i think it's kind of hack academic hazing uh, it's not the actual correct term but you're gonna have a little bit of that and the thing is is you just have to stick with it and get through that period because once it's done it it gets it doesn't get as intense as it was there so it's just it's just a snapshot 
a little snapshot of, of your whole entire college journey. Now we go focus on community college and if that's a good idea. So I did the community college route to engineering because there's a lot you have to do in engineering. And I'm surprised that people actually get through through it four years. I, I took five years. So I did two years at the community college where I got all my calculus done, my physics, my chemistry, and my general education. Actually, no, I didn't get my chemistry there, but I got my general education, my calculus, and my physics done. And then I went into uh, my, my college. And so I combined it like my freshman and sophomore engineering courses into one, which was a pain in the butt. It's all a pain in the butt. Uh, but, uh, you know, it took me five years and I didn't even take a summer off. So it's a lot to get through. Some people do it in four. If you already had your calculus done when you were done with high school, you, it, you'll probably do it in four. It just depends on how much preparation. It's just, just having, having an idea how long it's going to take and realization on how long it take it will be dependent on you. You know, some people take six years. You know, just, just have that up front. And so I, I got a lot of my coursework out in college. Save a lot of money going that, or in community college. Save a lot of money going that route. And all my credits transferred over into my college. I didn't have any issues with that. But then again, I already knew what I needed to take. And uh, the college I went to uh, accepted all the transfer credits. Some don't. They don't accept any of your transfer credits. I, I question that college. So as far as selecting college, preferably EBT accredited. Now, I wouldn't go out of state or anything. It's not going to matter once you get into the actual professional world. There might be a few places where like, oh, Ivy League, but it's it's not a big deal in the industry. When you start working, it it's no. not. Now there's alternatives to going through and getting your engineering degree. So there's two year technical paths that you can take. So you you can go through and you can take two years of college, get that basics down. And then some people just go into the industry like that. So it, it depends on what job you want to go into. And so there's there's a technical two year route that you can go through and and uh, within a few years, they're treated like any other engineer. And then uh, there's also the the no education path, or let's say no, you don't go through a traditional college. Now that's a lot more rare, but it is feasible. But there's going to be a lot more you have to prove in order to do that. So you, you see people online that went there and learned everything they needed to do about software, but they needed to demonstrate that during the interview process. Hi, girl. Hi. So if you're gonna go that route, you, you gotta bring proof. You know, if you want to do software, you know, show them the software that you've done. And that way, you know, they look at it and they were like, yeah, yeah, hey, maybe you, you are worth it. You got to have a realization on what you need to know for a traditional degree. So I take a actual list of college required courses for your particular degree and just go through them, get a general understanding. So it's going to be harder. It's going to, it might take less time, uh, but you're going to get a pushback, but it is possible. All right. So say hi, boo boo. Hi. So, you know, if you enjoyed this content, hit a like button, subscribe, and I appreciate you joining in. And uh, if you have a Twitter, go ahead and follow me at Brecky Check.